All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and I get to hold a mic and a clicker at the same time today, so this should be exciting. Um, I apologize in advance for the cliche title. It was the first thing that came to mind when I was writing up the summary of kind of how I approached and kind of what I thought about, um, but it stuck. Um, I guess it worked pretty well when we were kind of talking about session titles, but really what I want to talk about is how we, uh, how we at LexisNexis, and particularly on LexisNexis Counseling, which is one of our software products, have used uh, Pendo in the last year, really. Um, we had it installed back in April of last year. So how in the last year, We've been able to take, we took a very broad approach to our implementation originally in terms of how we wanted to use it because we needed to explore how our users would, would respond to that. Um, and so, first of all, let's level set on what I mean by mature enterprise products. Um, so for us, and kind of when I think about that, and I've had a career at a couple different places that have had large uh, kind of enterprise products that sold B2B. Um, first of all, we're not a startup. Um, Product I work on has been around for 19 years. A lot of the products that I've worked on have, very, have been around for a long time. Um, most often, the real telltale sign is that you've got large customers with sophisticated processes. Um, and so in our case, we're in the legal space, and we actually work with corporate legal departments. Um, other software I've worked on has been in things like uh, HR, pricing, um, different parts of like core business processes and so every customer is different. Every large enterprise says they want best practices as long as it aligns with what they do internally. Invariably you end up with complex and somewhat bloated features. Um, it just happens over time. You know, needs change, the market changes, etc. Uh, and probably some legacy technologies. In our case we were fighting the demons of five different UI frameworks that have been laid in over 20 years. Um, we are slowly rewriting all those into a modern technology and so our implementation of Pendo was exciting the first time because we thought we wired up every page. Come to find out a couple days later, we're like, why is this page not showing up? It was on a different framework, different headers, you know, to go find all that code and lock it all in. It took us a couple of weeks, um, but we did it. And immediately data was flowing in and we could see things that we hadn't seen before. Um, you might have other situations around this, but I think um, for me, the whole impetus behind this presentation was I was here last year. A lot of cool, fun, sexy startup companies talking about how they got value out of Pendo and the, kind of the B2C space. And I was like, but we're doing stuff too. And I think there's a way that we really can get value. And actually, for us, it was a way to leapfrog what we were doing, get out of some of our existing frameworks and thought processes and change that. So about CounselLink, we're in the enterprise legal management space. Um, and so what that means is we work with corporate legal departments. We sell them um, software to help them manage the work that their attorneys do and their relationship with outside counsel. So large enterprise customers um, have attorneys in-house when there's an HR uh, merger and acquisition, IP, or a variety of different things that happen, they'll use outside counsel to do some of that work for them. So those outside attorneys, those outside law firms, have to collaborate with them on the work they're doing, but also submit bills to them, invoices. We help our corporate counsel control their cost. This is something we call legal spend management. So there's matter management, which is the work they do, legal spend management, which is the financial part of it, and then increasingly a space called vendor management, which I'll actually talk about, I have a little bit of a mini case study about how we use that. Um, we use Pendo to help us actually begin to build out a new, new capability in the product. So 240 customers, 9,000 monthly users on the client side. Our secondary customer set, the law firm user, actually have more active users on a monthly basis. So we're kind of in a unique situation in that regard of who we sell to is not the most you know, voluminous user that we have in our customer base. Um, and this kind of unique point of scale for us is challenging because these legal departments are small. And so they need to kind of, that's kind of the whole purpose of the software is to help them stay small and lean and manage that effectively. At the same time, we work for lawyers. Uh, we build software for lawyers, and so the company as a whole is a little bit risk averse, as you might expect. Um, many of you probably know the legal research side of things. We have a whole research division. Even on the software side, um, it's software that we sell to lawyers who like to flex their lawyerly muscles every once in a while and remind us of contractual obligations and things that we've done. But it also makes us risk averse in terms of change. Um, the legal industry as a whole has been slow to change from a technology perspective. It's only in the last two to three years that the rate of change has increased significantly. So part of our challenge is how do we, a brand name that's well known in the space, continue to innovate and drive different product innovations and learn more about our customers and what they're really doing in an effective way. So our key challenges were twofold. One, customer intimacy and breadth of customer feedback. 
An exciting part of our challenge was also that uh, in the last, about four years ago, we moved the entire company from Sacramento, California to Raleigh, North Carolina as part of a, an overall shift in the company to consolidate development into one area. So we're based here in Raleigh, North Carolina on the Centennial Campus of NC State. Um, we've grown from 200 to 800 people in that office in the last couple of years. It also meant that our entire dev team that used to work on this product loved Sacramento so much, they stayed there. So you have a 20-year-old product with a four-year-old dev team and a less than four-year-old PM team. So, yay. Um, but we're doing it, and we're doing some cool stuff. So limited insight from existing analytics tools. We had things like um, Google Analytics, Splunk Logs, internal logging, all that stuff. They all require dev request to pull that information out. So create a ticket, put it in a sprint, we'll go figure out what you want. Oh wait, we didn't get all the data you wanted. So it's really hard to figure out what were people really doing, um, which is the second part, which we didn't know how they were using the app. We knew what they were telling us. We knew what our consultants told us because we have a heavy implementation team because we're sophisticated. We integrate with all their processes. And so consultants are saying they use the product this way. Our customer care team was saying, no, they use the product this way. Somewhere in the middle of that was the truth and we were blind to it and we couldn't figure out what it was. Um, customer feedback. We have a customer advisory board. Um, they're good. There's too few people on it, and we need a scale of feedback. We have, of the 240 customers, probably 20, which is a good number to have, 10% is a good number to have on an advisory board. It's the same people over and over again with the same problems, and sometimes there are older customers or our bigger customers. They don't tell us the entire customer base. And trying to call into accounts and get attorneys who bill by the hour, right, who are responsible for managing their time or just have that, it was hard for us to get the volume of feedback that we wanted. We have a corporate standard around NPS. Uh, we survey them. Um, we got responses. Our sample size was very small. Um, and I'll talk more about kind of the impact of NPS and how that kind of has been a major driver in our company, but I think we've actually finally got a path forward on that. So those are our challenges. Um, I had worked on a previous product at Lexus um, the year before, and we moved that development to Australia. I did not get to go, unfortunately. Um, so when that moved, I joined back on Council Link, and because we had Pendo on that previous tool, I said we have to have it because it changed the way we thought about building that tool. Um, and so we got it. We you know, we were here at the conference, we got it installed in April, and so everything we've got is from April on, so less than a year of data, but pretty meaningful change for us in terms of what we've been able to do. So the approach we took, I mentioned this earlier, um, was because we had a breadth problem, we wanted to, I'm gonna be limited here, um, really kind of understand how our user base would react to that, and how could we change our processes. So we definitely went much more of an experimentation approach. Um, so it was about starting slow, taking some measured actions early on, uh, and we chose to start with our release notifications because one of our challenges was customers told us, I didn't know you released that. I built the product for you. I listened to your feature requests. I understood your problem. I built it. I delivered. I put it in release notes. I told your account manager, your CC, and months later, you're still not using it. Why? Like, that was, that's one of our fundamental problems. And, Coming at that over several years of work, and we're just like, we're underutilizing, and people just don't know what we're doing. Um, and we also wanted to understand what it took from the PM's perspective to actually implement Pendo, and like, what's the overhead on using this for every release or to design a guide? Like, what does that take to do? So we started slow. We highlighted new features um, in our initial release notification. So we release quarterly uh, in the middle month of every quarter. So this is our May release of last year. So we had one month in, we had a little bit of data to know who was using it. Um, we put out a release notification. We put in new features. We embedded a video, which is something that was hard. We had tools in-house, like we have a little university training site that we can use to do videos. We went straight to YouTube. Come to find out, some enterprises block YouTube, note to self, um, and Vime, you know, Vimeo and everything else. So we actually had to go back to our partner internally, our training partner, and say, carve out a section that we can put our own videos against and then link them back. So they're internal, they come from LN. Um, what we wanted to make sure was like, here's a tour, here's a video, here's a link to release notes. Um, we did it and got really low conversion. So we iterated. Power of Pendo is that we were able to iterate on our release notification on the same day it went out. We're like, this sucks, what's going on? Why are these things not converting? Well, if you notice, 
we have advanced icons here, we have the dots here. Like we thought the carousel was a pretty standard technique, but we are an older product with older users who aren't hip to all the cool funness that goes on in you know, some of the designs that we come up with sometimes. And so we immediately shifted and said, well, what if we make it more obvious? Somebody put a previous and next button on it. The difference in design, we doubled our conversion rate and doubled our completion rate on the same, within a day. So part of the power is the rapid iteration and feedback you get, even around little things like a release notification. For us, that helped us understand that for our users, we need to be more obvious, more direct, and also you know, just watch the numbers as they come in. If they're not hitting our goals, then let's change and figure out what the difference is. And this was really immediate. And so that's kind of become one of our best practices now, is make things a bit bigger, more obvious, don't be quite as you know, cutting edge in terms of design as we, as we might want to. The release notification effectiveness. So part of this was that we were, as we were rolling out new features, we wanted people to adopt them. We wanted people to know about what was going on. So this is for one of our features. Um, and this data is fantastic because this came from trends, which we didn't have before. So some of this is awesome to see how trends and some of those other analytic capabilities have helped us now because we can go back at old stuff and look at, well, how many accounts interacted with that and some of the information that we didn't have before. Our previous usage of the old version of the feature was around 50 users a week. When the release notification went out, there was an immediate spike. And we're like, okay, people are just clicking on it, they won't use it again. I updated this with, through the end of like last month. Like, it's consistent, you know, there's a holiday, there's a holiday, but consistent usage there. So this has actually driven a permanent change in behavior and awareness in our, in our users because they're fully aware of, um, a, the feature was there. B, we've made enhancements to it, right? Because part of it was like, hey, this happens to be like a search page that we had. It's, there's more things you can search for and more capabilities on this page, and they're using it more. And it's not just they're using it more because it's easier or whatever. Accounts are using it bigger. Like, we've had account adoption, so it's being more broadly used as well, too. So it's not purely like a, just a, a click type thing. So really meaningful change from us, just from doing a simple release notification. So already out the gate, We've got to win on showing how fast we can change and iterate on designs. We've got to win on now feature adoption and breadth of adoption. Also added release notes. We always linked out to release notes. We sent release notification emails that are linked to in the product, that we had a message center in our product that we would link to. And we always knew they didn't get read because customers would come back and ask us questions that were in the release notes. And so he's like, we know you didn't read them. This is the trend from May of last year when that release went out till now by developing a pattern of being consistent and deliberate in every release, even our maintenance releases which go out once a month that are just like, hey, we fixed some bugs, enjoy them, it works. Like this is a pattern. We are changing the pattern and behaviors of our users by being consistent but also being deliberate in what we do. And it's really simple. It's just putting things in their face. So their views are going up, the interactions are going up um, with really simple, and these are just, you saw the release notification for our monthly maintenance release. It's a simple, small light box. It's two lines of text. Hey, monthly maintenance release is out, go use this. You know, here are the release notes if you wanna look at them. So the key successes for us, and this is all in that first month, um, was that we, the release notifications drove awareness for us. The, the guides show that they can drive feature adoption. Um, and so that actually drove us to use, previously Guide Center was called the launcher, and we had used that, we had used a custom version of that on the previous product. When Pendo released the Guide Center, we actually ripped out our help menu and replaced it with Guide Center. And the way we've designed it for us is that we have links to our overall help content. So we still have our help, we haven't done the integration there, so we still have our help. We have the ability to have guides that exist on certain pages. And so our, our kind of vision for this is that on key pages that we know are heavy interaction or that we have a lot of customers from, we can put in guides to say, here's how you use this page. Here's some key workflows. Here's some key things to do. What's new, we've adopted not only for um, release notifications, but also for marketing. Uh, notifications as well too. So the more content we can put in there, and it's passive because it sits up there in the help menu and they get a, uh, this doesn't show up, but they'll get the little indicator. So when they get that indicator, they can see like, oh, there's things going. And so it's a way for us to continually engage them and really retrain them because we didn't have that message center kind of visual notification piece before. So doing that's helped as well too. Um, and then of course, access to our support team. So yeah, go ahead. Yep. From the top of the screen. Um, are you guys using like the badge and the pendo that's new? 
We anchored it off of our old help icon. Yeah, so we just anchored it off of that. So we actually took out, we had a little hard-coded that was part of our product help menu. We ripped it out and said we're going to anchor off of that. And so that's the new anchor. And so it, it drops down from there. And we have full control over it now. So some things we've seen Pendo do that we haven't been able to do yet. Um, we're going to roll out like live support chat. We have it in some parts of the company when we do. We don't see a reason why we can't embed it in the form here. Um, and then you know, what part of the product cloud, of course, is being able to integrate off of Help Center and pull search articles out of that. We'd love to do that piece as well. Because right now, we still have too many tools they have to hop out into. And we want to begin to tighten up the experience and pull it all back in um, in the product. NPS. So we have um, a massive program at Lexus around NPS. It actually gets reported up to our CEO of our division. We have a parent company called Relex now, which is Reed Elsevier something something. There's six divisions that report into it. At that level, the CEO gets all the NPS scores of every company underneath of them. So we have the corporate initiative NPS. So I don't have that problem. I've got a problem of I have a metric that has effectively zero response rate. Um, that we see as a predictor of revenue. And so we've had enough examples of products that have increased their NPS that then saw in subsequent years an increase in revenue that is driving that kind of validation cycle for the company. So we've tried to kill it because we're like, it's not a good metric, it's too, it doesn't really work, it's too simple. That didn't fly. So when you keep, those things you can't kill make you stronger. And so we said, let's figure out a way to solve this. Um, and so for our problem was low response rate. So we do twice a year surveys. We were only getting, out of 12 months, 250 responses. And the results were fantastic, because everything that people loved us for is everything they hated us for. And it's been this way for years. Um, we use a variety of sentiment analysis, text analysis tools to drive out some other form of insight. And it always comes back the same, like make it work both ways and better. So completely useless. Um, the, the, you know things have gotten bad, and for the, I don't think anybody's from finance. You know things have gotten bad when like, the finance team gets involved and says, we can solve your number crunching problem on NPS, like give us the data and we'll find the magic lever for you to pull from a product perspective. And I was like, good luck. And they came back and they're like, yeah, we can't tell heads or tails of it either. Like it's, so we got it, we got to do something with it. Um, so we ran, a, we ran a survey, kind of a bit rogue, because we have a corporate standard, it's sent by email, it all reports up to a, uh, to a common system. So we ran it um, in less than a month, we had over 100 responses. So we had half of our annual response in one month with a sample group, a 15% response rate, which we were fractional percents, like less than 1% before. So um, this was a great test for us to say, hey, in-app NPS works. The problem is now, what do we do with it? Because we have a corporate standard, how do we align? Um, we've actually been working, and it's, almost live, I saw a version of it on Friday, or last week, um, where we have actually taken Pendo data, so we have the NPS response, we're gonna run it in-app using the new NPS um, survey that just rolled out earlier this year. We're taking that, we're running it in Pendo, we're gonna keep that data in Pendo, but because of the tool that we use, we use a tool called Confirmant, we have the ability to post that data into their system, we're actually gonna be able to double dip on the data. So we're gonna store it in our system and also post it over there. So we get what we need, which is all the data and analytics. And they get what they want, which is the data and the text to go back and get the answers for the overall corporate reporting out piece. So um, we expect, you know, we'll, we'll have that handoff probably this week or next, and we'll go live. And so, you know, the fact that we were able to really quickly prove out. We ran a, we, in two weeks, we already had the responses that we need. We kind of, it's definitely the, because um, we don't have the smoothing yet, because they haven't turned that on. All of our responses really came in in the first couple of days, because those are our power users. We did get the other, you know, 20, 30% over the last three weeks. But immediately, that response rate came in. We saw it. Um, unfortunately, it kind of confirmed what we kind of knew about our product in terms of where we were with NPS. So we were hoping for like a different, different view, different sample group. Um, but, tied it back to user behavior. And it's actually challenged us to go back and look at the underlying data. We always assumed that long-term customers would like us more than newer customers, because long-term customers kind of knew all the bumps and the warts and have been with us for a while. What we found out is it's not that easy. We believe, and we're having to tie up now the user account create date. It's, we believe it's actually how long the user has been with us. Because we have a, long, we have a couple of exceptions. We have one long-term customer that loves us, like in an embarrassingly way, because we're like, wow, you really like us. They said, yes, we do. Um, 
they love us, but even within their user group, we see that not everybody loves us equally. Like there's some customers, like some of their newer users don't like us as much and have given us that feedback. Yet in some of our other customers that are newer, a same imbalance, but we see that the older a user has been using the product, the more they've kind of adapted to it. So it's definitely an interesting shift for us. We're trying to prove that out with some more data and some more analytics, but it kind of drove us to a deeper level of what are they doing? Um, you know, what, how is that individual user doing that? Which is this insight we just couldn't get before from trying to tie it out through emails and trying to get this email over here to going through Splunk logs and user data out of our old system. We just couldn't make that connection. Yeah, this, uh, so this chart here is actually um, the chart directly out of Pendo. So this is um, by use, so on this side is pages that are, you know, this is page view, but they do it by features as well. So it's what do they use more by detractors versus promoters. So that kind of gives you like where their experience is being felt from. Um, additionally, you, there's also another chart that shows you high usage promoters, high user detractors and you can drill in and actually see the features they've interacted with in the last 30 days, or I think it's the last 30 days prior to taking the survey. So it's not even like, you'll go back and look at a response from historically, and the data is still there because all the historical data is there. You can say, well, prior to taking that survey, they were working in this part of the application. That kind of explains why they may have not had a good experience. Um, all the metadata, so you can also slice this by metadata. This is actually encouraged us to put some different metadata into Pendo. We don't load it, load it all in their session. We load it, side load it through the API a lot of times just to stamp it on the account record. Um, but things like account manager, what industry they're in, we serve, a, you know, our corporate customers are in different industries. Um, there's been some other little interesting insights because certain industries like us more than others. So there's just, there's little nuggets and so there's a lot more there. We just didn't have enough volume from a, a sample size to draw a major conclusion, but it started the conversation and it got us corporate approval to go drive this. And so us doing the integration with Pendo to use that for corporate in, for our NPS um, actually got driven by our customer insights team at the LN corporate level. So it actually went out of our hands. They said, yep, yeah, we see it. We want to drive it and, and adopt it that way. So higher response rate, tie it back to behavior, and we got an exception, which is pretty awesome for a new tool. So for us, NPS is seen as a um, driver of revenue. So it's a leading metric and leading indicator for revenue. The challenge you then have is, well, my feedback cycle on NPS can be pretty long. We're doing quarterly releases. I work on it, I release it, I'm doing the feedback. You know, I may not, get really good feedback on that for six or 12 months, depending on like when they, that next user gets that sample, you know, gets that NPS survey. So how can we tighten up that feedback loop? And better yet, is there a smaller element that we can work with besides just the overall product experience to actually get value of and see if there's another lever we can pull to drive a better customer experience? So we've been looking at this idea of um, feature success score. We kind of have ripped this off. Well, it's our version of something that another one of our products does. Um, one of our search products does what they call product success score, which is they're using machine learning to detect when a user has had a successful search session by the outcome of that session, which gets into um, if I'm doing a search for a research on my research platform and I save it, I print it, I annotate it, I do something with it, um, and I actually find it on my first page, we can actually detect whether or not that was successful or not. Did you get the outcome you're looking for? Because if you're researching and you do one of those things, you probably found what you're looking for. In a complicated workflow application where there's many different behaviors, trying to figure out, and this is our customer's data, so they're putting data in the system and retrieving that data. For them to figure out, for us to figure out did they have a successful session is really hard. And so we said, well, what if we can look at it a different way? So if we look at usage of features versus satisfaction, so if somebody um, has high usage but low satisfaction, if we can map that out, then if we focus on increasing their satisfaction, then we can probably get them to a better place. In a similar fashion, if we've got low usage but high satisfaction, it could be that it's a niche feature that we have to decide what to do with, or it could be that we just need to increase on the awareness of it, which we know we have an awareness problem. More often than not for us, it's an awareness problem. Did you know we solved this problem for you, that we did this job, and we have a feature functionality that does that for you? Then if you've got the double problem, which is you've got low usage and low satisfaction, um, then you've got to figure out what are your vectors, right? It could be 
that it's only for a small set of customers, in which case it's just about increasing the usage of it. Or it could be you've got to solve both things. It's underutilized because people hate it. And there's no doubt we have some of those as well, too. Like, there's just parts of the app that are powerful. They need to do it. But they're like, that's awful, so I'm not going to do it in your tool right now. So we've got that problem. So part of our goal is to start doing some of this and doing this analysis. So we're using surveys to do this. We use the polls. We call them surveys. But we do um, feature surveys. And we actually did this for a feature that we were building. And it was interesting because our previous prior to Pendo NPS analysis said, the text sentiment said, if you fix this one feature, this one page, and make it the overall UI better, make it less cluttered, make it more intuitive, you will solve your NPS problem. So we embarked on a year-long endeavor to rebuild this page. It's the most used page in the application. It's the core of like our financial review, our um, kind of uh, invoice review set pieces that we do. About halfway through, we got Pendo. We said, you know what? Let's run a survey and see how much people hate this. And the problem is they didn't. They didn't hate it. But this also is another place where we begin to learn and say, depending on who they were, depending on how often they used the page, how long they've been a customer, the scores varied. So we had once again had to drill down deeper into like a who gave us those scores to figure that out. And we really have to begin to segment our customer base. It's easy to do that in Pendo because you create the segments. We have to figure out what are the meaningful segments in terms of users and how they use the product and actually begin to develop versions of the features for those different users. Are you a power user? Are you a mature customer using our product? Or are you new to using a tool like this? And actually begin to calibrate the experience for those features. So in this one, the learning example was, it was better than we thought. Um, we've since rolled out the feature, and the numbers are about the same. So we did a lot of work. We didn't really have a win here from a feature perspective, but we did shift some of the sentiment. And so it's interesting now to see who shifted. Like, it really is like 30% like it more, 30% like it less, and 30% didn't even notice. So we're in this, that just shows that we've got some segmentation in our customer base. We have to go learn better and begin to adapt the experience for them and offer them different experiences. Um, the good news is this, yeah, so the, the other thing is 39% uh, response rate was massive for a survey. So here we are, we're now, this is mid-summer of last year, we've rolled out multiple different surveys and we're getting killer response rates. We're getting response rates from you know, people clicking through on notifications, we're getting the response rates from people taking NPS and surveys. So this is a powerful mechanism for us to pull. Um, we've used it as a baseline in terms of response rates and what's possible. The, the concept is repeatable. The one challenge we've got right now is that you can't meter polls differently than you meter uh, guides because a guide is a poll, or a poll is a guide. And so our challenge is we want to actually, we would love to be able to go out and say, here's the top 10 features we want to work on in the next year. We believe these are the key things and actually get that baseline data and get all that feedback well in advance of working on things. Because we would actually supplement it with, the first version of that survey we did was, it was a pseudo NPS. It was on a scale of one to seven. How much do you like this feature and why? So we gave them a follow-up. And we got a lot of texts like, this is too hard to use. I hate this. I can't see this. We're like, oh, all things that we kind of knew, probably forgot about over the years. It's a great way to collect a lot of that data in the moment. Um, so we'd love to scale it. The challenge we've got now is just making sure we meter these and don't over-survey the customers. So analytics for feature decisions. Um, so now we're getting into day-to-day. -day, you know, And this is going to be a little bit of minutia. I think the example works because it's really about us making in, in, intra-day, intra-sprint, intra-kind of development cycle product decisions, um, which we do day in and day out. And this is one that we thought was a good example to kind of highlight. So we're rewriting our UI. We're modernizing it. And we're trying to strip out stuff, right? We're a modern, we're a mature app. We've got tons of old features. How do we pull back on some of them? Or how do we redesign them? How do we pull stuff out? So little things like, well, here's our old search, which is the old school like search builder. And we said, no, customers kept telling us, give me Google like search. And we rolled that on other parts of the application and we knew we'd gotten some flashback. And so we're like, on this particular instance of where we were searching a list, is that really what you want? And what's the balance of that? So we actually went through and tagged the different operators and say, how often are we using the simple contain search, which is basically a Google search, right? Free text versus the advanced search operators. It came back 70% were simple, so that's good. The bad news is that 30% were advanced. And you can tie that back to who the accounts are, who those users are. We're like, they're on our advisory board. They will let us know if we make this mistake, right? And these are the things that, even from Splunk logs and other logs we had before, you'd find a lot of the 70% stuff. And this number might come back as like 10 or 20. You're like, eh, we can cut that out. 
But that's what causes us issues because we're so embedded in their corporate processes. When you break somebody's day-to-day -day workflow and somebody's been doing that for 10 years, five, 10 years, and one day you take it away, and we have customers that their teams are based on their productivity. Their productivity metric is how fast they can review the stuff that's in our system. And so when you're slowing somebody down, the phone rings and it comes all the way back down to product, and we're like, great, how do we miss that? So this helps us miss that, forget, you know, avoid missing that. Um, and so what we end up doing, and this is gonna end up casting light, unfortunately, we built the same search box in, but we defaulted it to contains. So for 70% of our users, they don't do a thing. They type, they click, and they're done. There's no more hunting and pecking for that. So little optimizations like that that you learn from, like what's the default operator? What's the most, most commonly used operator? A little tweak like that. Um, and we gave them their, their advanced search builder. Once you do a search, you get the ability to say add criteria, you click on it, and if you're you know, a super power user, you can get to your advanced features, but everybody else, the UI is uncluttered, it's simple, you type what you need and you go. And we solved it, we rolled it out, and no one's, like, no one's noticed. Like almost like it's one of those things. If you don't always get the rewards a lot of times, and you do good stuff, they let you know when you break stuff. Um, the good news is we actually have gotten customer feedback through our NPS, ironically, um, about you know release notifications, little feature enhancements that we've done that we've notified them of. We are getting that positive feedback, which is a welcome sign of relief for us of trying to say like, is this really working? Are they noticing? And even our hardcore critics are coming back and saying, yeah, you guys are doing some good stuff now. So a little small. Um, and we've done this, there's probably a dozen examples we could go through of like, pull the data. Like that's really my question now. So I lead a team of, uh, it'll be four PMs and two UX. And when we're trying to make hard product decisions, like what does the data say? Have you checked to see who are the top, pen, you know, who are the users in Pendo? Like have you reached out to the top 10, top 10 customers? Also, go to the bottom. Why are you not using this? You've used it once or twice, but you've never used it again. Why is that? So like having that easy access to who's touching parts of the application that we didn't know before has really given us a much bigger breadth of, you know, kind of way to think about solving product problems. Um, so yeah, we counter to customer feedback. So customers are saying, keep it simple. Yes, but we got to solve for that complex, that sophisticated use case. Um, we designed a solution that covered all customers, you know. We'd love to solve for the 80 or 90%. We're, we just, we're not at a point where we can start showing, we show tough love in some areas, but pulling features back, we just haven't quite nailed it yet. It's hard to pull back people that are really, really entrenched. Um, particularly when we are still trying to make bigger shifts. Like we need to make, if we can make some bigger shifts and develop like a version two of a feature that's totally disconnected from the first version, I think we can pull that off and say, version two doesn't have that. It's more best practice oriented versus we know the 10 customers that helped design that 10 years ago, right? We probably all have those features as well too of like the committee of five got together and said, if you build it, we'll use it and you do it, but they're the only five that use it. Um, I see heads nodding, which is awesome and also sad. I empathize with you going to earlier today. Like I feel your pain. Um, so case study, uh, this is, it's kind of, as I was putting these together and kind of saying, well, what's a good example? I think for us, this is an example of us pulling the whole Pendo experience back together and something that's actually still in dev right now. Um, and we'll, we'll tell you what it is. So boring product stuff. We have a matter centric view, which is the work lawyers do. We have an invoice view, which is how they submit their invoices and their spend. The intersection of matter and invoices is the law firm that did the work or the vendor. So that's why I call it a vendor profile, is that's kind of the piece that we ended up working on. Um, we do customer visits, we do customer calls, and on some of these site visits last year, we kept hearing that customers were like, you know, a law firm calls me and I'm trying to answer questions about, they're saying, well, I have a question about this matter or this invoice or something I've done for you, and I just can't find that information easily. It's really hard to find that or answer that question. So that's kind of a job to be done. I have a job to do when a law firm calls me I have to respond to their request. Or internally, one of the kind of uh, market pressures is going on is increasingly corporate counsel are trying to consolidate the number of firms they work with. So there might be a um, general counsel or somebody in their ops department saying, give me information about this firm so we can make a decision whether or not we should use them or not going forward. So that problem is starting to come through. They weren't telling us, they were just like, I just have, it's hard to find this information, you know, just FYI. And so we sat on it for a bit, but then we began to realize like, if we did a more vendor-centric view where we pulled in all things around a vendor and put it together, it would probably make it easier to answer those questions and rely less on our kind of reporting solution we have on the side. So that was kind of our hypothesis. Like, there seems to be something here. Can we back that up? 
So we went to path analysis. So this is the old page, the current page we have now. The pink is kind of what's important. It's randomly pink. It's just the color we picked when we tagged pages. But the pink is where they're going from that profile page and jumping out to another part of the application to go look again for some other information. So it's a way they navigate to other parts of the app. So they're coming into the app and very quickly jumping out. They're coming in at the law firm level. They're drilling down to an office level and then jumping back out. They're not finding the information they need. Like you can kind of see that in the pattern, right? So easy, quick way to say they're navigating away. They're either coming back in different places or going and landing somewhere else altogether. So it's kind of like, huh, there's some data that backs up that, that hypothesis that they're coming in, not finding what they want, and they're navigating out and then coming back in later to pull all the data together. So we did a quick mock-up concept, and it was crude. Like uh, the UX designer at the time did this in a... It may have been paint, it wasn't paint, it was something nicer than that, but effectively, like in an afternoon, like high level con concept, like here's a concept, we started putting it in front of customers and like, that's really awesome. And other customers were like, uh, maybe, but like they got hooked on the details, we got some interesting feedback, but enough feedback that says, there seems to be something here, how fast can we build it to validate it? Because the ones that said it was cool were like, well, will you use it? And they're like, of course I will, right? Like we've all heard that before. Um, and we wanted to figure out like, what were the, when we showed them this concept, there's a lot of different things on it, like what was most important. In the end, it's getting to some of the visualizations that kind of show them how their data is interacting, but we knew we had to land on an intermediate step which just pull the data into one place and then we'll figure out the right visualizations. So we started working on it. Um, it didn't fit in one of our release cycles. Enter mature, heavy, complex code that we don't really know. It's a kind of a weird part of the, the application. Um, but we said, can we get enough done? And so part of our thinking was, can we get to a beta version of this to get it out so that we can get the validation to figure out if it was nice enough to leave or to get the feedback? We just wanted more feedback. Did a release notification, same thing. And then we started driving to the new feature. So did a notification that drove you to this new view. Our beta was actually buried. It's a link you had to click on next to the kind of the in-app link. So it wasn't like here's a new page. You had to opt into this beta. But I made it pretty easy. I made it visible for you here. And if you went to the old page, you get a similar view here that says, hey, here's our old view. Try our new view. The view was incomplete. It didn't have all of the existing functionality in, but it had enough of the new functionality we wanted to validate. So we were less worried about like, give them enough so they know which profile page they're on, but there's a whole bunch of customizable stuff you can do, or like, forget that for now, build out the stuff we're trying to test, which is if I put it all in one place, will you use it? Um, and we gave them a tour. So um, within the week of the release, first day actually, 50% of accounts tried the new feature. So they took an extra step to click into the new feature to do it, right? So when, that's a hard thing, because we couldn't have done this before. Like realistically, we couldn't have done it without Pendo, without a lot of extra custom code on top of this. Um, page use, and so notice like this is the trend. We're way out in March now. Half of our views are still on the new thing, which we haven't done anything with. We launched it back here. We're still developing the next version of it. There are still customers and users that are clicking into that new view because it's more valuable to them. We did a walkthrough, long. I wouldn't necessarily advise them being this long. This is like the max, and you know, we'd love to cut it back, but it was, we had to highlight all the new stuff. And so we did massive completion rate, 40% completion rate. We, the last step of this guide is a poll that says, did you find this valuable? 100% of people who took that poll said it was. So we have nailed the walkthrough. We've nailed the beta informative, like here it is. Like for us, this is a great win because this is an underdeveloped feature that's out in an early release version that we put a hurdle in place to click through that people clicked in, ran a walkthrough and said, yes, this is valuable to me. So like so many levels that we hit this on um, and we did this in yeah, our September release. No, sorry, not, this was, I forgot now. February, sorry, lost track. It was this, this back in February. So the version of this is gonna come out, it's gonna come out in May now. Um, did it work though, right? So here's the same path, and look now, over 50% of the users that are using this path off that new page are drilling in and not going anywhere else. This is actually a pathway we created that didn't exist before. So they're going to a different part of the application, but through a path that we created. So we, have, we understood what they wanted, which is drill down deeper into different views, and then also give them a path to the other parts of the information, and it, it works. We have shifted their, how they're using that. 
So one of our hypotheses we had going in is like, can we change their behavior? Will it work? And it all worked, and it all came out. So we use paths to validate the initial problem. Um, the combination of paths for the analytics, you know, using trends to see does it really change and all the trending behavior, um, but notifications and the walkthroughs, like we pulled it all together in a package. So we kind of have a model now of how to roll out new features and how to do it, even in an underdeveloped, underdeveloped state. Um, and then, you know, we're going to just track the trend analysis, which we're surprised by that, you know, weeks and months later, they're still interacting with it the way they did before. Like, we got the initial high, of course, but there's still enough value that they're finding a way to interact with that. So we're really looking forward to rolling it out. Uh, so what's next? Process maturation. We did a lot of experiments this year. Um, we have, as another tool for our team, we've had some changes in our corporate, you know, we've kind of reorg, restructured teams and responsibilities, and so now it's like, how do we really mature our process around this uh, in a way that makes managing guides better? Um, we're up to over hundreds of guides now, which is challenging to like, how do you manage those? How do you manage the process? How do you QA them all? Um, because while it's fun to say, oh, I can, I can put a guide in to solve that, um, who QA'd it, right? We've had broken links, we've had some typos, like some of that's just like tension to detail, but it's also just, you forget that it's an app that's moving every day. And so you retag something, you change something, it doesn't work. So how do we mature our, our guide process? Um, our app complexity is annoying. Um, the same page you can land on in both our legacy, we try to fix it as we build out new pages, the same page, the same URL, based on some super secret coding developed by some developers, 10, 15 years ago, like the parameters in the URL, which are highly cryptic, mean different things for how that page builds. And so for us to figure out like what page they're on, what they're actively doing, and giving them a guide that's relevant in that moment, super hard, like painfully hard. And we guess a lot, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but we get, it's a problem we have to go solve. Um, and then we really want to roll out feature success, but we've got to figure out a way how we're going to manage these surveys. So we're going to go live with the NPS, that'll be twice a year. We want to get these surveys going. With our smaller user base, because our customer set is just smaller, how do we get the volume of feedback in time to build up, like, what are really those pain points and how do we meter that? Um, styles and templates, we did a lot of experimentation this year. We've landed on some stuff. We're updating our product style guide. We've iterated a few times on that, and we've also drifted as we've kind of grown our team. So we have to tighten that up and carry that back over to our style as well, too, for Pendo to make sure it's, and, and those of you who might have been here last year, I know um, uh, Salesforce, it was um, data.com, I forget who it was, one of the customers there, they had a, they did, they went the style of like, I'm gonna make it contrast heavily. And so there's the theory, like we're trying to figure out now, do we want to have it blend with the application or do we want to really have it pop out and kind of punch in the face and be like, oh, something new. We might test those a couple bit to figure out what really works best. Um, so there's probably some testing to go on there. Um, and then really, so the NPS we're gonna roll out, then it gets into how do we do guides for support deflection, particularly from our law, our law firm side. They're our second, secondary customer. We're less worried about support and onboarding for our corporate customers. We have a whole service team that manages that. But our law firm users, we don't really have direct interaction with. They're our customer of our customers. And so how do we support those guys? Because they're actually, there's more of them. Um, and there were one of a dozen systems they might use. And so they, they interact with us in a different way. Um, and so we think there's some way we can do this. Um, yeah, and then feature success. So yeah, that's it. I mean, that's, that's kind of our, our kind of blitz of a year in a nutshell, some of the things that we did. Um, it really has changed the way we think about making product decisions, the way we roll them out, um, and the way we think about you know, how fast can we go and what can we learn, um, and, and the questions that we act as a product team and how we interact with dev, because our dev, most of our dev team has access to Pendo as well, so they'll dig in as well too. Um, and so it's always kind of fun to have the questions of like, yeah, there's somebody who's using it, if we're gonna migrate them off of that functionality, let's find a path to do that. What's the technical solution to migrate them and, and consolidate and you know, pull some of the feature, blow it out, and reduce complexity? So, uh, we able to, I think we have, are we okay on? Yeah. If, okay. Uh, uh, ten minutes. Cool, awesome, score. Questions? We do it, um, so we have two that we do through Pendo. So we still send our emails. The other challenge we have with emails is that because we're a large organization, a lot of organizations now are on our 
do not spam list. And so that kind of cascades to all the products. So um, we still do the what's new and we still do um, the any page, they, no matter what page they land into, because a lot of the, we still send, um, we send app notifications of like, hey, you have to go review this thing, or this needs your attention. When they click in, that way they always get it on that page they log into. We know they'll just, they may just miss that, sometimes they don't. Um, so we kind of hit them twice. We haven't really checked, it's actually, I had a question I had of like, which one's more effective? We haven't actually checked on that. For right now, we're, no one's complaining about either, so we decided to keep them. But it's probably a way for us to optimize like what we do when. Yeah. You mentioned that when you were looking at the NPS stuff, you would be like, oh, that's just introducing a lot of this feature before they took the survey. Maybe yep. that's why they're dissatisfied. Do you guys take any efforts to like increase usage breadth of the product like, to be more on the happy side of the features? Historically, we haven't because we've, we've had licensing in the product that was, like, we may not be able to cross populate somebody because. There were parts of the application that people were a bit happier with, but they may not always be licensed for that. We simplified our licensing model, so we actually would make it easier for us to say, hey, you should go try this and do this. Um, so probably not as much. Like, we also, our sample size was small too, so we wanna make sure we got more data. But one of the ideas we figured out is like, how can we cross sell somebody or um, actually, our CSMs love this because they'll get customer references from this. So if we know, hey, just the other day, um, they asked me like, hey, who's using this part of the application that might reference that for another customer? It would make sense to go get somebody who scored that, who's a promoter, who uses that a lot, who can speak on their behalf and be a reference for another customer somewhere else. So that's kind of another way we're gonna, we plan to use that. Excuse me. What do you think your, like, because you guys are gonna start trying to remove some of the blue features. Yeah. I don't know if we have an answer for, yeah, I don't think we have an answer for that. I think it's gonna be, if we can do an edu, it, for us it's gonna be educational, because for a lot of these customers, they're institutional, so they'll go, and we actually have some customers that want our release notes and things earlier, so they can update their training materials, and so that's the bigger process. So we have to come back and say, um, I didn't really talk about it as much. We did a phased rollout of a feature, the one that we did the survey on. It was such a big change. We actually, the first time we actually rolled a feature out, um, to customers' segments over a period of time. It would probably be a model like that, where we said, here's the new version, and we slowly work our way up through our, our tiers of customers, because we have like less mature and then more sophisticated customers. We, we did that with um, this invoice page that we rolled out, and it worked really well. We thought there would be massive support calls, because it's it was literally a rewrite of the top page in the application that is used as a core business process day in and day out. And we switched it out and didn't have it. We, we changed the way it worked. We changed key functionality. Um, we did simplify some things. And so I think the key there is gonna be probably doing a phased rollout and getting the feedback along the way to, to calibrate on that. And if it, there's, our dev team will tell you, there's weird feature switches. So the more like weird feature switches we can get rid of, the less stuff we have to build that we can just tighten up. Um, it'd probably be some metric along those, like, you know, I forget the number of lines of code we're trying to get rid of as well too, so. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, we're here. So, uh, when you released the beta search feature, mm -hmm. you showed the chat, you know, you had a percentage of users that immediately clicked on it when you released the beta feature. Um, what do you think the percentage of users that actually clicked on the beta feature was compared to when you released the beta feature? Um, when you're working on your, your second iteration, could you weigh in any information that, you know, anything you observed about the users that chose to use it and didn't? We've reached out to them. So a couple things we have also at our disposal. So one, we're actually reaching out to them and saying, hey, you've used it, what's your feedback? Um, a miss on our part is we have a survey that fires after they've used it a couple times. So we went the, let's not get their initial impression, let's see if they come back and use it a couple times. We think we've calibrated that too high. And so the, that survey hasn't fired for enough users to get like kind of a tell us your thoughts on it. So we'll probably adjust on that piece. The other thing we have in our disposal, we have an idea portal. And so we've had customers that now flow over to the idea portal are saying, hey, I love this new thing. Like, when can I find out more? Can I talk, like, how do I give you feedback other than saying, like, I love this? So um, we've had a couple different places we could have gotten more feedback from. But part of it's also just proactive outreach from us because we can see who's the heaviest user and be like, and we had some surprises. Like, why is, this, why is this client and this person at this client using this so much? And so we reached out to them and they're like, because this is my job. Oh, great, tell me more about it. And we've, we've done it that way. So we did it more of the passive versus less than the tools. We kind of reached out more on a, I guess, more of a direct route that way. Over here, and then, the, yeah. So you mentioned that your users aren't the most technically savvy people in the world. Um, do you, were there other UX decisions you made, like designing guides for that, to try to counteract that? 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's still one we're dealing with, which is I didn't know the number of people that still use like 1024 by 768 as a screen resolution. Yeah. So <laughs> evidently it's popular with a certain demographic that happen to be heavy users of our application. So um, yeah, we've blown a couple of guys. We're like, I can't, and we've seen some screenshots which have been awesome of like, oh, you're just zoomed into 400%. That's why you can't, so. Um, we're gonna have to go do things like put in scroll bars on the guides that actually give you the button inside. There's some things, it's hit us enough times that we're like, the education part's not working. So that's gonna be part of our next style guide is making sure that we tighten things up to a minimum size that it should land properly. But if you've got your Yahoo, your Ask Jeeves toolbar and you're zoomed in, like you should still have access to it. Um, and that's, that's just so annoying. Everybody's like, oh my God, this guy is falling. It's like, it's one call guys, just, but yeah. It's that kind of stuff. So design for all of your demographics. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, and it's all been broken. Like we we've gone through every version of it. Um, actually, I just got somebody told me today, like, hey, when you retag some of those pages, you broke this and broke that, and I was like, oh, like so. Some of it Pendo is pretty good about. Like if you try to do a feature page thing, it'll catch those guides versus pages. It doesn't catch. So we've renamed pages, and the guide no longer fires. Uh, little stuff like that. So FYI, that's a trap. Um, page naming. We have a naming convention. It worked, but now it's really really long. Um, and that sucks because it's like we used to, like for features it was page name maybe section or what you were doing and like the, like the feature like edit or whatever. All of a sudden now everything's super long and so we're trying to figure out like how do we shorthand this? But there's similar functionality in some parts of the app, so we have to have some you know naming convention that holds. We'll have to revisit it. We haven't rolled out the CSMs fully because of all this stuff that you mentioned. And we also anonymize a lot of our data, so all of our account IDs and visitor IDs are all GUIDs. They're anonymized. So unless you have a lookup to go with it it's a little value to you. So we're trying to figure out a way to you know, kind of get around some of those things. We'd love to roll it out to the entire company, um, but it's like, here's Pendo and your companion lookup guide. Um, just the, you know, our security practices there. So I love that. That's probably a great topic for somebody who's like, who's got a really awesome practice around this? Because it's, it's, we're, we're, that's probably what we need to do as our process maturation is like, what's our templates? How are we gonna manage this? It's stuck, but what you're gonna find out is what you do in the first 90 or six months you know, 90 days to six months is not gonna hold as you kind of do and change and you iterate. You have to kind of revisit it periodically. Good question. Hey, when you were talking about reaching out to your users, mm -hmm. We have emailed and called them. Um, we've done some feedback, like, hey, give us feedback here. The challenge is it goes back to actually, when we have four dev teams all working on independent streams, the same, we're afraid the same user gets hit too many times. And so then it's the, okay, wait, if I'm the third guy to build a feedback button, I've gotta make sure that only show this feedback button if they haven't seen the other two, which gets in that need of like being able to meter feedback and polls. So you can say, only hit somebody once every 90 days for a feedback. Um, and I know there's PM people in the room, so I keep saying that. Um, but that would be really awesome for us to get that feedback coming in a lot more often. That's our biggest challenge with doing it through the product is that our users overlap segments and they overlap features of the application. So we're just trying to be, we've pushed a lot out to them and we want to be careful we don't keep pushing too far and say stop spamming, I have a job to do. Email and phone been successful? Yeah, it, yes and no. Like, the good news is we get volume now, so I can go and pull a list and I'll get a list of, we did, so our UX designer on our law firm side, we pulled a list of 100 law firms. And she emailed 30 and got 10 or 15 responses back saying, hey, we'd love to talk to you about your experience with this part. The good news is that we have volume of data and who they are. And so we do a quick lookup to figure out who they are, send out the email, and you'll get enough. And you can just, we just go through like, okay, first 30, second 30, whatever, till we get the numbers that we want to feel confident with what we're doing. So it's, that's, but the good news is it's really easy to find out who's using it. and. Seeing the difference of like, oh, this person, like there's a couple parts of our application where in a 30 day period, somebody might click on something like a thousand times or less. And then one customer is like 10,000 times. And we're like, holy crap, like what's going on over here? 
they have a different process and they're just using that really intensely. And so even seeing that level of ch you know, usage has changed the way we think about the product. So sounds like we're, are we at time? So we're at time. I'll stick around. I'll be here in the hallway, but love to keep talking with you guys. Thank you.